not that we we share a lot of things in caucus because we're not uh, we're not a big group. Thanks. Good morning, bonjour. I'm joined today by my colleague Mary Marbrick McMahon from Beaches East York, who's going to say a few things about um, the last week and the government's response to the Auditor General's report. So it's been now exactly one week since the Auditor General released her scathing report into how Doug Ford and Steve Clark cracked open the green belt and broke the public trust. All to make sure a group of well-connected insiders and Conservative Party donors got an $8.3 billion payday. And all that we've seen over the past week is the Premier, Minister Clark, all of Cabinet, all of his caucus, desperately trying to tell us that this is all about housing. Make no mistake, this is not about housing. It's all about one thing. It's all about that $8.3 billion payday, ensuring that, and ensuring that those insider friends got what they wanted. It's all about the money. Ne vous y trompez pas. Tout ceci n'a rien à voir avec la construction de ces maisons. Me, même si Doug Ford et son gouvernement ont essayé de vous en convaincre, il s'agit d'une seule chose. Il s'agit de ces 8.3 milliards de dollars et de s'assurer que ses amis obtiennent ce qu'ils veulent. It's been one week. Minister Clark still has his job. His chief of staff still has his job, still collecting a salary. Minister Clark must step aside. His chief of staff must be let go. It is simply unbelievable that the public trust was broken while a select few got inside access to government and still not one person, not one person in this government has been held accountable. The government's assertion that no one knew anything except for one political staffer is simply not believable. Doug Ford and Steve Clark are trying to pull the wool over our eyes and act like they absolutely had nothing to do with it. $8.3 billion and nobody knew nothing. And that's how it works in Doug Ford's you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back government. And if you need any evidence of how unbelievable the last week has been, just take another look at the Minister of Finance's press conference. Look at how uncomfortable he was. Look at how he couldn't defend what was going on. Look at how, how angry he got. He knows that what has happened is totally indefensible. And I'm willing to bet there's more than one cabinet minister in that government who's got, and caucus members, who've got that same sinking feeling. This was not right. And I'll pass it over to Mayor Margaret to explain how this has nothing to do with housing and everything to do with the $8.3 billion. Sorry, Mayor Margaret. It's getting stuck there. Good morning, everyone. Well, 2026 cannot come soon enough. The people of Ontario are livid at the latest government debacle. Ontarians truly treasure and value the Greenbelt. They understand how important the precious farmland is and how vital the wetlands are for climate change mitigation. Must I remind the government we are in a climate crisis? Ontarians get it, but obviously the government does not. We are hearing from residents all over Ontario about this latest nightmare, regardless of political stripes. And you know it's bad when we are hearing from conservative voters who are furious at the government. The government that they voted in in 2022, but they sure as hell won't be in 2026. No one believes in government corruption. Rewarding your rich friends to the tune of $8.3 billion? No one. Not while the world is burning, healthcare is being neglected, the public education system is in shambles, and Ontario, and I could go on and on, Ontarians deserve better. But actually, the Greenbelt is a distraction. 
It is a tactical play by the government to divert our attention away from the issue that matters to Ontarians, and that is housing. And I know firsthand from my days at City Hall how that this is their playbook, and they are masters at making us look the other way, with one controversy overlapping another controversy and another and another. Housing is the issue that matters most to Ontarians, and they are nowhere near their lofty goal of 1.5 million homes being built in the next 10 years. The government is far, far behind. The Premier and Minister cannot hide the inaction on affordable housing or any housing for that matter. Housing starts are down 20% this year. The government has still not implemented. They've only implemented four of the 55 recommendations put forth by their own housing task force. And two of these recommendations were just commitments to targets. The Auditor General's report shows that there's sufficient land for the target of 1.5 million homes without the need to build on the Greenbelt. The government's own task force even made that clear in February 2022. They said, but the shortage of land isn't the cause of the problem. Land is available both inside the uh, existing built-up areas and on undeveloped lands outside the green belts. Why waste taxpayers' dollars with this task force if you're going to take, not take the sound advice of experts and just leave the report sitting on shelves collecting dust? What this government needs to do is to concentrate on building homes where people want them, in existing neighbourhoods where the amenities and services are already set up and the communities already exist. This government needs to stop creating chaos and start focusing on building housing and to do it now. Enough of the corruption. Enough of the $8.3 billion rewards to your rich friends. Stop stalling and get your shovels in the ground in the right places. As a passionate environmentalist, I will not stop the green belt from being carved up. Uh, sorry. As a passionate environmentalist, I will keep fighting to prevent the green belt from being carved up. You will have to bulldoze me out of there. Who's with me? All right. We'll take your questions. So I know that people understand that the developers have the opportunity to benefit from this by potentially billions of dollars. But where do you think that Ford and the PCs, what are they getting out of all of this? Oh, well, just take a look at donation records. Just take a look at PC party donors. And one of the hard things to do is when you, you can look at donations from those specific groups, but then you have to look at people who are connected to them. And that's a really challenging thing to do because what you know what how these things work is people say, I need you to do this, I want you to help talk to your subcontractors, talk to your contractors, people you do business with. So there's no question and you know if you take you go beyond the green belt, you take a look at four thirteen, I think uh, there was a study done on that which showed all the donations all the way along another government decision to build a highway, to spend billions of dollars to benefit a small group of people. The, the green belt is a public trust. It's land that we took and we said, all of us together said, we're putting this land in trust, not just for ourselves, but our children and our grandchildren. And the reason we're doing that is we want to preserve the natural environment. We want to stop sprawl. We want clean air and we want clean water. So we're doing this. It wasn't some pipe dream. It has value. And what the government has done is extracted that public value, that thing that we hold dear, and said, here you go, folks. Go make some money. That's what Doug Ford did. That's breaking a trust. And it's a quid pro quo. Just take a look at their, take a look at their fundraising records. Very clear. So what's the answer here? Campaign finance reform? I know the Ford government has loosened the rules. What do you think needs to be done? The, can, the, can, the solution here is an open and transparent government that actually tells the truth. You know, what Minister Clark and Premier Ford tell us, they knew nothing. They're lying. I don't like using that word. I've never used it in this place. But that's what's happening. You know, I can say they're pulling the wool over our eyes, they're deceiving us. But at the end of the day, they knew. They know that they knew. And what they're trying to do is distract. And they're trying to say, hey, this one staffer, this one brand new chief of staff, literally months old, orchestrated this whole thing all on his own. When all the evidence points in the other direction. And, you know, the premier doesn't want to tell us who he's calling or who he's talking to. 
People are using their private emails, their private phones. I mean, we've already had a discussion about that in this place, about how there should be op more openness and transparency in government. We have rules around records keeping. We have rules around using your personal accounts. There are rules. They're breaking all those rules. And they don't care. They don't care one iota. They're going to do what they want, when they want to do it. And then they're going to spend all their money and all their time trying to tell us, we're trying to fix a big problem. And it has nothing to do with that. Because as Mary Margaret said, you know, they're not going to meet their target with those homes. That's not where people want to live. So what's it all about? It's all about some people getting richer, a small group of people. And sorry, I'm going to go on about this. What the real problem is, is that's the focus of the government. So where do the rest of Ontarians stand? Ask yourself this question. Since Doug Ford came to government, is your health care system any better? No. Are your schools any better? No. Is our environment cleaner and safer? No. Is it easier to pay the bills? Put food on the table? Pay your rent? No. That's a problem. That's the effect of what this government focusing on doing that is. John, is the Ontario Liberals planning to make any additional um, re references to the uh, integrity commissioner or any other? There, there, there are some. There, there are some uh, things that are outside the scope of the Auditor General's report. Um, some pieces that we've still been working on that are uh, not specific to the Greenbelt but in other areas of the province where the questionable use of MZOs and expansion of urban boundaries. Um, you know, uh, there's one in particular in Ottawa that's a bit concerning that's uh, in Orleans where, you know, there's a, a clear history of donation and a piece of land was included in the uh, the gre in the expansion of the urban boundary that was not requested by the city and uh, geologically is, is a problem and is not really connected to anything. So it's, why, do, why did they pick that piece of land um, without consulting the city? And all of a sudden, it's now in the city's urban boundary. But it just doesn't, you know, it just, it doesn't smell right. But as it relates to what we learned in the yeah. Auditor General's report, yeah. um, are the Ontario Liberals planning to contact either the Integrity Commissioner or even the OPP. There's been some suggestions from some Ontario Liberal leadership candidates that the OPP should get involved. I'm wondering what the official position of the party is. Do you guys believe that the OPP should be getting involved? Well, in I'm going to say exactly what I said last week is there's a lot of smoke around this. The Auditor General's report, new evidence, new smoke. I know the Auditor General has brought it to, um, uh, brought it to the OPP. They have to make that decision to investigate. It, you know, uh, you know I, I can't tell them what to do. Other than say, than I say, and this is just, I think is an important thing to say is, there is mounting evidence that something happened here that broke the public trust. And that should be intre of interest to the OPP, could be of interest to the RCMP, um, will be of further interest to the Integrity Commissioner, I think. And, uh, and so there, I mean, there are things um, like the retention of government records. Uh, that's not only the Integrity Commissioner, but the uh, Information and Privacy Commissioner. You know, it, it, this is not, um, you know, uh, Doug Ford's personal sandbox. He just doesn't get to make up all the rules, not tell anybody what he's doing. And uh, that's not the way that, you know, we're supposed to conduct ourselves in government. It should be openness and transparency. You know, it's, um, and as I said last week, this isn't going away. This is just the beginning. Um, I'll bet anybody lunch will be here next year at this time talking about the same thing. Colin did a great story uh, about Doug Ford not using his personal cell phone for a week and trying to get information on that. What is your response using to that? Using his government phone for a week. Is it, was that or? He did not use his government phone. Sorry. He was only using only his personal used, cell phone. My apologies. Oh, no um, what, what do you make of that? And what does that suggest to you? Well, there is a pattern. 
of the government, of, of the, not just the government, but the Premier breaking the rules. And it is against the rules for the Premier to use his personal cell phone to do government business. It goes for everybody in government, ministers, political staff, public servants, everybody. And why? Because the public have a right to know what their government is doing and who they're talking to. It's a reasonable right. And the Premier doesn't think it's the, the Premier doesn't think anybody should have to know anything he doesn't want them to know. He just thinks this is my like this is my personal little playground. I'm going to do whatever I want. And you know, just uh, and when you know, and then when something happens, you know, like last week and other times throughout the course of the government, he gets caught. They get caught in this bind. The premier appears. You know, when it starts with um, kind of like an eight-year-old kid going, like, I've been caught. I know I'm in big trouble. I take responsibility. You know, folks, I take responsibility. I'm really sorry. It'll never happen again. Right? It repeats itself. But ah, shucks. You know, I was trying to do a really good thing. And then pull the wool over people's eyes. But saying you take responsibility with no accountability. No one's accountable for what happened. Not one single person. Nobody's had any sanction. Nobody's even been called out. Like the Premier and the Minister don't even think that the Chief of Staff did anything wrong. And you know why? Because they were part of it. That's why. They knew. Dr. John, do you, have, do you have any, uh, I'm sure you'll express some optimism or confidence that this issue will make an impact in the minds of voters? Because it occurs to me that we just had an election last year. Uh, the line about Doug Ford helps his rich developer friends, that was a line, that was an issue in that election because of the NZOs. We didn't have the green belt yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the other things, rule breaking, uh, the notwithstanding clause, all sorts of these kinds of issues be raised. And what happened? You guys got defeated really badly. They won with a bigger majority and a record low turnout of Ontarians cared at all. Well, I think we have to look at back at the last election and having come through, you know, a few years of the pandemic and people being exhausted both politically and news wise, right? There's just too much coming at people every day. I think right now the difference is there's mounting evidence. We can actually put a dollar value on what happened here, $8 billion. So to the average Ontarian sitting at home, maybe their ER is closed. Their kid's school isn't any better. Right? Some people are struggling to put food on the table because there's no rent control. And the government's, we're talking about this. We're talking how, about the, how the government took care of their friends. That's not what we should be talking about. So it's not just this scandal. It's what the government's not doing, what the government's not focusing on, that's going to that's that's going to come back to bite them. I mean, it's not going to be one thing. The difference with this thing is, I think it will be a long-term discussion. It'll be ongoing. There'll be more evidence, and well, you know, unfortunately, those things that Ontarians depend on are going to fall further and further behind. Like, and we're struggling to keep our ERs open. You know, um, times are really tough for people; they're really tough. And the problem is, is the government—they're not taking care of the little people. They're not taking care of the average Ontarian family. They're taking care of their friends. They're taking care of people who they cozy, who cozied up to them, who supported them. Look, you know, if, sorry, I know I'm giving a long answer. This is a public trust that has just been broken. If these were stocks and bonds and securities, 
what do you think would be happening right now? All hell would be breaking loose. I think that'll happen with this eventually. It's just not happening right now. But it's just because, you know, translating the breaking of the public trust, it's a bit easier now because it's about $8 billion. It's easier to see. And then people will look at the light of the 413 decision and, okay, oh, the same people are benefiting from a government decision, spending billions of dollars that will give those people along the 413 a huge uplift in the value of their land. Just a question for uh, Mayor Mark yeah. McMahon. Um, you made a statement of, a few moments ago that you will have to bulldoze me out of there um, in relation to any Greenbelt construction. And that's, are you just being hyperbolic or are you serious? What do you mean? You're going to have to stand in front of some trees? Well, I'm, if you, the number one reason I jumped back into politics was the climate emergency. I have a long history of environmental activism and um, I'll do what I can to protect the green belt, if that means being in there and, and uh, protecting it, that's what I'm going to do if it comes to that. But you know what? It's, uh, the government's crossed the line on this with their own base even. We're hearing from conservative voters how ticked off they are with this. That green belt is precious to more people than the government realizes, even their own base. So they need to reverse this decision and build in existing neighborhoods. You see all these protests all over Ontario at the MPP's offices. Our inbox is overflowing. We've been putting up green, save the green belt signs all weekend. I will do what it takes to protect that green belt. And so that means what, physically standing in front of a bulldozer? We'll or see, we'll see. I hope the government comes to their senses and reverses their decision and does the right thing for Ontario and to preserve the precious green belt that was put in for a reason, a very important reason. And, and John, just on another note. Um, well, if, if Mary well, Margaret will chain herself to a tree, I'll chain myself to a tree. Are you going to organize that? Like a well, we got to wait till the bulldozers chaining. come. We might hope that they can come. <laughs> I'll get the bulldozer ready. <laughs> Can the party afford change right now? Let for running over. Sorry, um, go ahead. Paul. Question. Uh, so in a couple of days, TVO, some, uh, the members of TVO are, are set to walk off the job. They say the government is offering contracts instead of full-time jobs. I'm just wondering what the, what, what the party thinks about what the government should be doing with that contract negotiation. It should be giving people um, benefits, giving them permanent jobs, giving them some security. That's what people need. You know, for the government to, you know, uh, th this TVO, another public good. You know, a, f a few years ago, we were going to end over-the-air broadcasting. That's what, the w in government, there was some conversation about ending that. Well, I fought against that in caucus, because not everybody can afford internet. TVO is a really important part of this province. Education, information, political news. And they think they need to provide it with some stability because it's a public good. And you know what? It's a conservative idea, right? It wasn't liberal government. So why, why, you know, why are they giving 8.3 million in value to the developer friends and cheaping out on TVO? Those are Doug Ford's priorities. It's a rounding error. It's a rounding error for something that's a public good. And um, I think the government's just taking the wrong approach. Yeah, they, got a, they got a bargain, but they have to give people some stability and security. If you want to have a stable, organized, it's like the healthcare system. If you want to have a stable workforce, don't have Bill 124. Government doesn't get it. It's because they're focused on the wrong things. John, are you really surprised that the governments aren't taking accountability when it's the politicians who decide the rules and penalties? I mean, isn't there a conflict of interest there? I mean, lots of governments have had scandals over the years, and each one of them has come through virtually unscathed. Well, I, I would say that, you know, that that is not necessarily true of all, of all you know. People go uh, to jail for shoplifting diapers. But yeah. I don't see politicians going to jail very often. Well, you, you, yeah, you, I mean, that, that's fair ball, you know, um, and it's, um, you know, there are 
things that we could do with the Office of the Integrity Commissioner that would strengthen that. We talked a bit about that and the connections between a family affair and, you know, people are doing business with the government, right? People's members' families. Yeah. I, I really think, you know, I, I really think the set, like the sad thing, the, the, the bad thing about this, aside from the $8.3 billion, is that the things that people elect us to do, people they send, the, the people, the things that people send us here to do, just make sure the healthcare system's there for my mom when she needs it. My kid's having trouble in school. Just make sure there's somebody there to help them, right? I can't pay the rent. Just make sure my landlord can't jack up my rent so that I can't put food on the table. We're not talking about those things. We're talking about how a handful of people took advantage of all of us, and the government let them do that. John, you've been a political staffer. Do you think um, Ryan Amato acted unilaterally? No, not possible. I would, uh, you know, I've worked in a premier's office. I've worked with minister's offices. I worked in a minister's office. I did that for 15 years. Well, we'll say 12 years, to be accurate, for 12 years. It's not how things work, not on a decision of this size. Why? Because ultimately, Ryan doesn't make the decision. Right? The chief of staff doesn't make the decision. The minister makes the decision. The premier makes a decision. So Minister Beth and Falvey makes a decision when they vote for it at cabinet. Is he the fall guy? Hundred percent. One political staffer masterminded this eight point three billion dollar transfer of wealth to a small group of people who happen to be PC donors, progressive conservative party donors. I used to be in the grocery business. So I was thinking maybe we should need a new PC insiders report. <laughs> Uh, different color screams. There might be a trademark. I'm sorry. I know you can. Okay. I just did knew there was really a few work people. In the grocery business? I used to work in the grocery <laughs> business. There we go. I did. So it was just sorry. I had to say it. I knew there were a few people who might be old enough to remember that. Effectively, any land protected in Ontario anymore? If it can only. Oh, there's, there's still. Yeah, well, not, not if the government's going to just change things willy nilly and, um, and do whatever they want. You know, just to repeat, this is not about one political staff person masterminding this whole thing with nobody knowing it. Who believes that? Who really believes that? Oh, I can think of one columnist who does, but I'm not going to mention his name. Uh -huh. But anyhow, um, anyhow. We have callers on the line. Oh my gosh, shocking. <laughs>
crazed environmentalist or anti-housing or something like that? I'm not a crazed environmentalist. And, um, you know, changing myself to a tree is a metaphor for how far I'd like to go in making sure that we get to the bottom of this. That's, it was a metaphor for that. And uh, I, I think I'm a reasonable person. Um, I understand, you know, that, you know, the balanced need, you know, uh, for, um, for making sure that we protect our natural environment and that we ensure that, you know, uh, people's lives are, um, you know, people ha have a good quality of life. Um, so I'm not a crazy environmentalist. And I think if they try to paint me as that, they'll have a, a hard time doing it. I believe in protecting the environment. I believe in the public trust of the green belt. And it's an, it's, it's an, it's an important thing for us to protect. That's why it's there in the first place. And people of all parties, of all stripes, agree. And so that's not crazed, a crazy environmentalist. You know, and I don't think Mary Margaret is. I think she's someone who's passionate. You know, but that, you know, so in case you weren't, that was a metaphor. I have never changed myself to a tree. Um, and I hope that I never, ever, ever have to. Look, it's not going to get to that because Ontarians are going to rally up, as they have been, to protect the Green Belt. And the government is going to have to listen because it's mostly their own base as well. And they did listen with the notwithstanding and they backed down. And they did listen to the farmers and they modified that that policy. So they're going to hear, like, Ontarians aren't taking this line down. They are, you know, as I said, they're protesting at MPP's offices, they are uh, filling up our inboxes, they are demanding this be reversed. And so the government's going to have to listen. Besides, um, it's only three years till 2026. And I'm not sure that any of that land that they've cracked open um, will be ready to go because uh, most of it's not serviced. And uh, most of it's very hard to develop. It's all about speculative value. Right? And then Anyway, sorry, I, I won't uh, belabor. So, is there any other questions on the line there? Next question from Ahmed Albayumi, Polly Corner. Please go ahead. Hey, John. Happy hey. Wednesday. Um, the Attorney General's report revealed that the land swaps was not were not intended to be a one-time exercise. And what the Premier staff were telling um, the Attorney General, the, the Attorney General, the Auditor General, <laughs> was that, um, you know, the government intention was to continue with future land removals. Um, the housing minister, on the other hand, told Bonnie Lissick that there is no current intention to prepare for a second round. So I wonder, what do you make of, you know, the mixed messaging? Do you think that, you know, in the near or distant future, there will be a second round of removals? And if so, how, besides from, you know, chaining yourself to a tree, how do you fight back again? Well, uh, thank you very much for the question. And I, um, and I, you know, look, there's no doubt in my mind uh, that um, um, Doug Ford's back has been scratched a lot. His party's been, back's been scratched a lot, so he's still got a lot of backs still left to scratch. So there won't be any, um, there won't be an end to him trying to crack open further lands. Um, you know, it's interesting that, you know, the dissonance between the minister and the premier. But you know, I, it's understandable because they're all having a hard time getting their stories straight. So, you know, I, um, I do believe the minister should resign. I do believe the chief of staff should resign. Do I, you know, the, the um, it all starts at the top. It's all the direction of the premier that's making this thing go. So nothing would surprise me. Okay, and um, the second question, I'm gonna pivot from the Green Belt and ask you about the Ontario Liberal Party leadership race. Um, the party yesterday announced the dates for the leadership debates, um, the first one being on September 14. Yep. We've heard calls from some of the cam uh, from some of the campaigns to have the, a first debate before the membership cutoff, like the deadline on September 11th. Do you support those calls? Do you think there should be a debate earlier before the 14th? Uh, no, I, I think we've set up, a, you know, as we did last time uh, with the leadership race, we set up a series of debates. Uh, I think they're at the right time. Um, I think, you know, the time right now is for candidates to focus on building, you know, their support uh, amongst um, Ontario Liberals and people who want to become Ontario Liberals. 
Um, I think that you know there'll be lots of opportunity for the candidates to get together before uh, the members cut off. There have been. We've had by-elections. Uh, we've had a, a rural route summit that many of them were at. So um, those are opportunities for members. I think uh, I'm very happy with uh, with the leadership um, race that we've set up in terms of the number of debates um, and our venue for um, you know our, our date of December second. Uh, and uh, I fully support what uh, the chief returning officer has put forward and the party has put forward. They work very hard at it. And, and let's remember, um, and this is a shout out to the people at the party office, we have six people in the party office. Six. And uh, we're going to run a great leadership campaign because we have a great team. And uh, organizing each one of these debates takes a lot of work. Takes a lot of work because we want to do a good job. We want to make sure that people have access, that we can uh, make sure that as many Ontarians are able to see those debates. So uh, five is um, a good number. I think it's what we did last time. So, uh, and there'll be lots of opportunities for candidates to uh, showcase their platforms, and their policies. So I feel good about it. So no, I wouldn't change it. Long answer for no, I wouldn't change it. that yeah, no more questions. great thanks a lot thanks for your patience